awesome do the band sound? They're so amazing. Give them a big hand. You know, I was in on Wednesday bringing Josh to band and um, the sound that these guys, I was just so blown away by um, the sound that all these young people are making. And, um, you know, you're, you're such a blessing to us as a church family because you just, you've got such commitment and you're consistent and um, faithful and you've got a willingness to learn as Connor was sharing there about not even knowing how to play an instrument. And, you know, it's really amazing testament um, what you guys, the amazing sound that you make. We're really grateful. So awesome. Give them another hand because they were so good. <clears throat> cool. So um, we've been talking a little bit about um, service and stewardship in church recently. So um, just talking a little bit more about that today um, and faithfulness. So we're talking about kingdom thinking. So it says in Matthew 25, 14 to 27, just jump straight into the parable of the three servants. And Vicky, thank you so much for amazing the media. I'm going to get it all, <laughs> get it all written up for you. It's fab. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. So this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and um, earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called to them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, if you knew that I, had, I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least then I could have got some interest from it. So, my first point tonight today is God has invested in you. <laughs> so, in the King James Version, it says, instead of silver, it talks about talents. So, um, traditionally, this parable of the servants with the talents has been seen as a, an address or a communication urging someone to do something. So, Jesus' disciples are being urged to use their God-given gifts into the service of God and to take risks for the sake of the kingdom of God. These gifts have been seen to include personal abilities, like talents in the everyday sense, as well as personal wealth. So how can we apply this parable to our lives? Whatever God has given you, don't hide it and don't bury it. We are asked to be good stewards with our finances, and we will ask also to be given, given account of what God has given to us in talent, ability, and our capacity for empathy and love. He's invested in us. Whatever he's given us, whatever is unique to us, he expects a return. In this parable that describes the servants, um, they were given silver or talents according to their ability. So it would be highly unusual back in those days to, for a servant to be entrusted with a master's money. But he invests in each of them. And by doing that, the servant becomes a steward of the money um, of what he's been given. 
So the master gives the bags to them and then he goes away. He doesn't really tell the servants what to do with the silver or the talents. Um, sometimes God will give us something um, that will be given stuff and things by God, whether that's ability or our money, but he's called us to be stewards of that thing or all of those things. So a servant waits for instructions, so they wait to be told more what to do. But a steward has to think and be wise and make decisions about how he will use what he's been given. As stewards, what are we doing with what God has given us? Are we being good stewards with what God's given us? So the second point I've got is service with a smile. <laughs> We've been talking a lot, obviously, about service in our church context this um, this recently, and especially with our fantastic serving teams. There's so many great teams. If you're not in one, why not? <laughs> it's fun, and it's a really important uh, part of building God's kingdom. Um, there are loads of teams that you can get involved with, speak to somebody after the service. Um, when we're faithful in service, God rewards our obedience. So service is so important and it's something that's not really held in that much high um, value in our society today, is it? So um, I remember, yeah, it's, it's like not it's every man for themselves, every person for themselves really um, in society. But we're, we're called to be countercultural, so we're not supposed to be like that. I remember growing up and in our family, we had to do various chores within the family. <laughs> I didn't always like... Um, the tasks I was being given at the time. Did anyone else remember getting any chores? Put your hand up if you got chores at home. Don't make me feel alone. Oh, I feel much better now. That's great. That's good. Um, so yeah, I think I started off with shoe cleaning or something like that, um, which for a little girl, I probably was about five. I think I was quite young and um, I had five siblings and mum and dad. So that's a lot of pairs of shoes. My dad liked a shiny shoe. So I was that was my job. Um, it was a simple job that I learned how to do and it contributed to the house working and the family working together. I think I graduated from there to washing dishes maybe, um, uh, all, all by hand, no dishwasher. And then peeling potatoes because we ate a lot of tatties with that many kids. Um, and then on to ironing, mowing the lawn and cooking for a large family. Um, lots of different chores and all great skills to have. So thanks, mum. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I get it now. Taught me well. By doing these tasks, not only did I develop my skill, but these were small tasks that I could contribute to my family. When everyone takes a role within the family, all the work gets done much quicker and everyone learns different tasks in the process. It's healthy teamwork within a family body. And that's why it's important as a church family also um, and in building God's kingdom. <clears throat> So we all have a part to play, no matter how insignificant that may seem to us. It says in Zechariah 4.10, don't despise the day of small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. So that's really important as well. God has given us all individual unique talents, and when we work together as one body, God is building his kingdom through us. So um, what talents has God given us? Um, that's exciting, you know, it's exciting that we're part of that and God's family and God's kingdom. With the talents that God has given us, we're asked to be faithful. So what is faithfulness? Faithfulness is doing something when you don't feel like it. It's often something beyond what you might be comfortable with. Um, it's doing something that you may maybe don't get the credit for or even noticed for. It's um, about being consistent. It's longevity. And it's actually a test for God's promotion. So God has given us all the, the chance and an opportunity. Um, it may not be what we had in mind, but um, God's still giving us, each one of us, opportunities. Um, God's kingdom is an upside-down kingdom, so things are not valued in the same way. It says in Matthew 20, 16, um, so those that... So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. God doesn't necessarily give us the things that we're prepared for either. Sometimes the opportunity can come with a bit of chaos, maybe. Um, it won't necessarily be plain sailing. 
God doesn't promise that we'll have no difficulties, um, and but he does promise to walk with us and never leave us or forsake us as we go through challenges. If we were perfectly prepared for all the opportunities that God gives us, there would be absolutely no need for faith because it would just be what we're doing. So faith is required for God's opportunities to come to fruition. So it's not all about us. Um, we might actually feel more scared than prepared in stepping into things. Faith is essential when we're out of our comfort zone and God is preparing us for something bigger. So it says in um, faith, faith shows the reality of what we hope for, the evidence of things we cannot see in Hebrews 11.1. 1. God invites us to step in, out in faith. The enemy would try so hard, and he does try so hard, to kill our hope. Has anyone heard of the imposter syndrome? Anybody heard of that? Yeah? So it's a condition where people can feel anxious, um, not experiencing success internally despite being high performing in external objective ways the condition often results in people feeling like they're a fraud or a phony and doubting their abilities so this can result in people doing, demonstrating different behaviors like people pleasing behaviors wanting to be liked by everyone perfectionism being highly self-critical the fear of what other people think that we've got to somehow get everything right um, or to be right all the time. Um, it can manifest in like paralysis and the inability to move from where you are. Seemingly, you're, a person is stuck in a rut, fearful of change and fearful of failure. Or it could be procrastination, which is avoidance of tasks or actions to help propel you to another level. A series of self-sabotaging actions and to even avoid trying all together for the fear of failure. These are all examples of the enemy's tactics to make you down and to take you down. And don't let him do that to you. Like, just don't let him do that to you. My third point is speak your faith back. Start talking on the level that you've not seen yet, the level that you're not seeing. Speak life into what you can't yet see in your life. Um, in Joel 3.10, Joel said, um, let the weak say I am strong. In Deuteronomy 28, 13, the Lord will make you the head, the leader, and not the tail, the follower, and you will be above only, and you will not be beneath if you listen and pay attention to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today to observe them carefully. Start speaking God's promises over your life. You know, God spoke the world and the universe into life, into being, you know, so words matter how we talk about ourselves. Um, in Genesis 1, 1, 5, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he spoke everything into being. So we can speak life into our situations. We don't have to follow some negative inner monologue um, inside our own head. The enemy will always distract us um, from God's full purpose for our life. So fighting back with God's word in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division for, of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging every the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. And in Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinks in his heart, so he is. So what do you think of you? What do you think, in, what do you think in your heart? What do you feel in here? Does it line up with what God says about you? Start speaking life into your life and to yourself each day. Say, I have the opportunity, you know, to be a better mother or to be a better father. I have the opportunity to be a better wife or a better husband. I'm sure Steve's happy about that. Um, I have a chance to <laughs> save relationships, you know, to build businesses, to overcome illnesses. I have the chance to get out of debt. I have the opportunity to get out of debt, to break free from addiction. I might just be 11 years old, or I might be in my teens, or I might be in my 20s, or I might be in my 80s. But God has 
huge opportunities waiting and ready for me ahead. You know, positive um, God words, you know, what God says about us. The enemy hates it when we talk with hope and he wants us to be down on ourselves. He wants us to lose hope in God and ourselves and our future. Hell hates it when we speak life like that. So speak God's promises every day over your life. So my fourth point was shine with a new mindset. <laughs> it's the attitude of our heart that changes our traje trajectory. It builds us for God's kingdom. So instead of asking ourselves, why is this happening to me? Or why is this not happening to me? Maybe we should be asking, what is God preparing me for? And what is God teaching me in this process? Even though it's tough. <clears throat> We're stewards of God's opportunities and we all have a chance. Don't shrink away from who God made you to be. We need to stay humble and serve with humility, but we are builders for God's kingdom when we are fulfilling all that God has called us to be. Let the light shine, because when we shine, it can liberate others. And it gives other, other people permission to shine too. So it took a lot of faith for the servant to receive the master's wealth. You know, sometimes maybe we can be a bit like that as well. Do we find it hard to receive God's blessings? Can you visualize yourself with what God is trying to give you? It might, re it might require change or growth. It might be a challenge. But God... God wants you to know who you are to him. He doesn't want you to self-sabotage the route to your full potential in Christ. God says, if you're my child, you need to serve. We can't be selfish and serve. I can't have an attitude of like, well, what's in it for me? Like, what am I getting out of this? You know, that's the way the world thinks, and that's not how we're meant to think. So we all need a breakthrough in our minds. Stewardship requires discernment, and as stewards, we've got to think and be creative with what God has given us. So there's lots of ways we can be creative um, with what God has given us. Um, it's the master's decision, so God decides, you know, what we, what we get. Um, it says um, in that parable that, you know, the master decided to give one guy five bags, one guy two bags, and one guy one bag of silver. So right there, we would probably be, probably spend the rest of the day or the week or the month or years <laughs> going, how come they got that and I got this? You know, it's imagine how we could be like looking at other people. So let me just say that comparison is the thief of all joy. It's not wise to compare ourselves with others. It's a privilege to be stewards of what God has given us. So what return am I giving to God? In the parable, the, five guy, the, the guy with the five bags brought back 10. The other who had two bags brought back four. Both of them doubled the investment and the, and the servant given one. He only brought back one because he, was, he had fearfully hidden it away. He'd buried it because he was afraid of his master and there was no increase and his master was not happy. So my fifth point is the last one. So the attitude determines the altitude. So are we hiding or burying our God-given abilities and finances? Are we avoiding God opportunities because we're afraid or fearful? We can't really rely on our feelings. Like that's not what God asks us to do. The feelings can be deceptive. Our mindset will control our assets, not just financial and material things, but things like wisdom and grace and strength and even relationships. God won't tell us how to do absolutely everything, but he gives us all the chance to seize the opportunities that he gives us. What will Jesus find us doing? Will, he, will we be like making excuses and saying, you know, blaming other people for not having a return on what God's given us. Let's make sure we keep our hearts right with a good attitude and use our God-given talents to create increase for our master. We need a fresh mindset to see what God is doing for us. 
When we serve, we're given stewardship. Christ wants us to have transformative thinking, to break free and to have complete breakthrough in our lives with him. So in Matthew 5, 15, um, it says in the message, here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on the light stand, shine. Keep open house and be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So we have all been given this time to seize hold of the new opportunities from God and to live in his full potential. Let's serve with glad hearts. Let's be good stewards with what God has given us. It's a new season full of hope, at hope. <laughs> let's seize it in Jesus' name and let's take it forward. Amen. So... At the end of the service, normally we just ask if people would like to give their life to Jesus if they haven't already. So we're just going to say a quick prayer. And if, if it's the first time you're praying it, you can just, I'll ask you to put your hand up maybe after. And it's not to target you, it's just so we can pray with you and give you a, a, a few things after the service to help you on your journey. So. If we'd all like to say it together, we all just say it together anyway, every week. Um, so, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry I have not lived as you have wanted me to. I ask you to forgive me for all my sins. Please give me a fresh start with you today. I want to walk with you. I want to live life how you want me to live and fulfill my full potential with you. From today forward, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Please help me with the areas I struggle with. You know exactly what they are. I thank you that you have made me new today to live in your will. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So if you prayed that for the first time, if you want to just put your hand up quietly while heads are bowed, nobody's watching. But if you want to put that up. Thank you. Awesome. Cool.